The moonshot is an audacious goal that you believe if you succeed in achieving, you would change the trajectory of how humanity is going to live. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 192. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here on a weekly basis to take your health to the next level. This week, our featured guest is Naveen Jain. He's an entrepreneur and philanthropist driven to solve the world's biggest challenges through innovation. He is the founder of several successful companies, including Moon Express, Viome, Blue Dot, TalentWise, Intellis, and Infospace. Moon Express is the only company to have permission from the U.S. government to leave Earth orbit and land on the moon. Viome is focused on disrupting healthcare with the goal of making illness elective. Naveen Jain is a trustee on the board of the XPRIZE Foundation and is on the board of Singularity University. He's been awarded many honors for his entrepreneurial successes and leadership skills. As you can tell from Naveen's bio, he is an incredibly unique individual, and we actually got the chance to see him speak several weeks ago in Toronto, which was amazing, and we're so grateful to have him on our show. So here's what we get into. We talk about what is a moonshot and how to find yours. We are mostly microbial with a little bit of human DNA sprinkled in. Chronic disease comes from chronic inflammation, how to properly rebuild your microbiome, and what qualities make up a successful entrepreneur. So much great information. Excited for you guys to listen. Here we go with Naveen Jain. Hi, Naveen. Welcome to the show. Jesse and I are so excited to have you on the Ultimate Health Podcast, and we had the pleasure of meeting you while actually seeing you speak in person in Toronto a couple weeks ago. How are you? I'm doing wonderfully well, and it's so good to hear your voice. Naveen, it's so great to have you on the show. There's so much that you do and so much we want to get into. But to give the listeners a little bit of perspective of who you are, where you came from, I think a great place to start is telling your story of where you grew up, which is India. So can you just take us back there and share your story growing up as a kid? We grew up in very humble beginnings. There were days we didn't have much food to eat and I think the most unfortunate part was that my dad, who had a great job, if he followed the system of bribery and corruption, could have given us a lot. Rightly so, he decided he wanted to be an honest man. And since he wasn't taking any bribe, not only we had little money, but most importantly, he was transferred every six to nine months because if he wasn't taking money, his superiors weren't going to get any money. And that means that we moved from village to village every six to nine months until we ended up in some of the most remotest villages in India where there was nothing to be done. So he wasn't taking anybody's bribe away. And that to some extent, you would argue that as a child, not having a stable place to live and having to make new friends all the places all the time, it would put a lot of pressure. But I really believe that is exactly what helped me become who I am. I became comfortable with the change. So as most people get so uncomfortable when the change happens to me, that became a part of life. So when something is not falling in place or change happens, I am very comfortable and more at peace with that. And I really think that helped me shape who I am today. And I think the values that my father gave us, all of us, was wonderful that never compromised the integrity for anything. And even if your life is at risk, you always do what's right. And doing right is what mattered to me. So continuing on the journey here, it was 1982, you came to the US. And at this time, you only had $5 in your pocket. So just continue to give us perspective. How old were you at the time? I came to the United States and I was about 22 or so. And Came to New Jersey with $5 in my pocket, didn't speak the language, and was working for a company and getting paid about $3 an hour type of job. And it was a very tough living because I came in summer and things were wonderful in summer until the winter came about and it started to snow, which I have never seen in my life. And I thought, what a great country where the white stuff falls from the sky, because that's something I had never seen before. Until in the morning, you start to see that you can't go anywhere, didn't have the warm clothes, didn't have the boots, and start to get the holes in my leather shoe. And it was, to some extent, very, very tough. That was the time I decided that maybe this wasn't the right place for me, and I wanted to go back. And I did 
plan to go back at that time. And there was a gentleman who actually persuaded me that I really should stay in this country and go to California and the Bay Area where all the tech industry is and I would fit right in there. And that's exactly what I did. And to some extent, changed the trajectory of my life. I want to talk about your company, Moon Express. You're the first private company that's been granted permission to land on the moon. So how did this come about? As you know, we are actually looking at landing on the moon. The moonshot there really is to save the humanity from potential extinction. That we all live on this single spacecraft, we call it planet Earth. And if there was something to go wrong with our planet, whether we get hit by a large asteroid or, you know, we are quite capable of destroying it ourselves, we as humanity would completely disappear until we start to think about that could we distribute humanity on multiple places. And there is no better place to start than our nearest planet, the moon. To a large extent, we have to think of that as our eighth continent and really be able to connect as if we are living on other seven continents and be comfortable. Interesting thing is once we learn to live on the moon, the same technology can be applied to live on the Mars and the Titan and Europa and other places, and thus distributing the humanity to multiple places. There's obviously so many ideas that you had around this and you've done your research, but I need to understand how can we live on the moon? Like, are we living in spacesuits on the moon? Like, how would this work? That's actually is, you know, thinking about everything that is possible. Never look at the world as is, but focus on the world that you want it to be. And every problem that you see, you think of it as an opportunity. So the bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity. So as you mentioned, you know, a lot of people will say, wait a sec for a second here. How can we live on the moon? Don't you know there is a tremendous amount of radiation and the human body cannot survive in the radiation? Are we going to live in some bubble or something? I mean, that's not the life we want to live. And I think, you know, then you start to think about and think nature is an amazing innovator. We find these bacterial organisms that are actually growing and thriving in the radioactive nuclear waste. So imagine the nature has not only figured out how to survive its DNA or how to protect its DNA against a massive amount of radiation that's coming from the radioactivity, it has also learned to use the radioactivity as a source of energy. So imagine if we can take the genetic material from these bacteria and use the CRISPR technology to modify our own genes, the human genes, suddenly not only we become the radiation resistant, we start to use radiation as a source of energy. That means in the evening, we could be asking and say, hey, sweetie, do you want to go for a walk and get some radiation rather than saying, let's go out and have a pizza. As an entrepreneur, you could think of hundreds of reasons why you should never do it. And one of the reasons would have been, wait a sec, what's the point of starting a company? How are you going to ever get the permission to land on the moon? And as an entrepreneur, my answer has always been, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. And that's what we did. And the second part of the puzzle was that even if you get the permission to land and even if you can find all of the minerals and the materials that you want to bring back, what gives you the guarantee that you will actually get to own it rather than it will be confiscated because the property of the society and not individuals. And as soon as you bring something back that actually you will lose. And here we sit here where President Obama signed into the law that says anything we bring back, we get to own. And we are the only company in the universe that has permission to land on the moon. And the reason it happened is because we were able to convince the White House that we have to start treating moon very similar to the international water, that we don't really have to own the property. We simply be able to own the resources that we bring back. Second part was by making sure that if we don't get the permission to leave planet Earth from United States, we have plenty of choices. And when you have plenty of choices, you have leverage. That means we didn't have to launch from United States. If U.S. government says, look, we're not going to give you permission, we could launch from India, China and pick a place you want. And that is something as you can realize that when you are inside the tent, you can follow the rules of the tent. And if you're outside the tent, you get to pee on the tent. <laughs> Well, while we're talking about the moon, let's talk about a moon shot. This is a term that you like to use for setting big goals. So elaborate on this a little bit. So the moon shot really is an audacious goal that most people believe is unachievable. As an entrepreneur, you always have to believe the minute you start to believe something is impossible, it becomes impossible for you and not someone else. 
So to me, the moonshot is an audacious goal that you believe if you succeed in achieving, you would change the trajectory of how humanity is going to live. To me, those moonshots are the one that moves the humanity forward. And to large extent, even if we fail in achieving everything we set out to do, you still move the humanity forward. Every time when I was talking about Moon Express, people will say, oh my God, you must be really, really passionate about a space that got you going. And now when I talk about Wyoming, which we're going to talk about soon, you will say, oh my God, you're so passionate about healthcare. How did you get to be so passionate about health? And really turns out, I hate to say it, it's not about my passion for space or passion for solving healthcare problem. It is simply the passion to be able to make an impact on the lives of billions of people and starting to think about what are those areas that if you do succeed in achieving would change lives of billions of people in a positive way. And that is the kind of things I personally enjoy doing. So to me, it wasn't really about space and rather than simply that if we don't do it, then as humanity, we could completely be extinct like dinosaurs. And that's not something I don't think that humanity is going to enjoy. And the second part also is to me, when you land on the moon, not only we become the first private company, we also become the fourth superpower. And that's symbolic of what a small group of people are capable of doing. That means you start to show people there's nothing that can't be achieved by a small group of dedicated people. So as I was finishing up the actual moon shot of going to the moon, and as you know, we'll be launching our mission to the moon in six months. And I started to think about what should be my next moonshot. And I started to think both about, you know, should I do education or should I go uh, look at the healthcare problem? And I explored both of them. And it turns out the problems were very, very similar in both the cases in a sense that people believe in both cases, the system is just not working and people believe the system is broken. And turns out that actually system is doing exactly what it was designed to do. In the case of education, Our education system was designed to teach us skills. And in the world of exponential technologies, any skill that you learn becomes obsolete every five to 10 years. That means it's quite likely that by the time you graduate, the skill that you learn is no longer required. That means our education system now has to completely change. Instead of teaching skills, it has to be about learning to learn. It's about not learning a unidisciplinary approach But how do you learn in a broad way so you can apply interdisciplinary skill to solve problems? It becomes more of a collaboration rather than individual contribution. And all of those things fundamentally have to change. And if we don't, then we're going to have this thing called chronic unemployment. And I think that is quite a reality if our education system continues down this road. Same thing happened in the healthcare system. It was designed to teach infectious diseases. And it works really well. I go back 100 years ago, people were dying from infectious diseases. You could go to a doctor and the doctor will give you medicine. The life was absolutely wonderful. And now what we are actually facing is these chronic diseases. And these chronic diseases happen when you're essentially, by definition, you're always sick. And you're dealing a system that was designed for episodic sickness has to deal with a chronic sickness. And the irony is that many of the cure for the infectious diseases are responsible for creating these chronic diseases. And also what's really happening is that as the system becomes big, it starts to become an organism in itself where the survival of the organism becomes the only purpose and the actual purpose of why the system was created actually disappears. So if you look at our healthcare system, it currently believes that only people who are the stakeholder in the healthcare systems are the pharmaceutical companies, the insurance companies, and the doctors in the hospitals. And the patient is a nuisance that they have to deal with just to collect the money. So that means they don't really think of patient as a stakeholder, but the patient is a cog in the wheel that needs to go through so that everyone in the system can make money. That is really the fundamentally why the system is just completely broken at this point is that pharmaceutical companies have really become a parasite on humanity and their sole purpose is to keep you sick. When you have a chronic disease and you have a CEO of a pharmaceutical company saying that the best drug we develop are the drugs that people have to take for the rest of their life. 
the best drugs are not the ones that cure a disease. Best drugs are the ones that simply suppresses the symptom and then you have to take for the rest of your life. And that kind of system is essentially to large extent using us as people as guinea pigs to basically keep making money from us. And to me, it felt like the time has come where the science has moved forward so much. And what has surprised me most is that the doctors and the medical system is not even teaching the students what the basic human biology is. So today, when you go to a doctor, almost every doctor believes if they can somehow get rid of all the bacteria and viruses from the human body, and a sterile human body is the most healthiest human body. And the little did they realize that our body is more like an ecosystem where we are consist of trillions of these microbes with a little bit of human DNA. And most people may not realize that our human DNA only produces about 19,000 genes Whereas these microbes in our gut produce somewhere between 5 million to 10 million genes. So if you look at from the perspective of nature, we are mostly microbial and with a little bit of human DNA sprinkled into it. And that ecosystem is what makes us who we are. And when we disturb the ecosystem or we start to change the ecosystem or we don't take care of the ecosystem, our body starts to become at unease. And that unease is what we call disease. Now we're going to take a quick break from our chat with Naveen to give a shout out to our show sponsor, Perfect Keto. I can't express to you guys enough how much I love the MCT oil powder from Perfect Keto. Why I love this is because different from MCT oil, this is a dry powder form, which means there's no sticky mess all over your bottle. It's not dripping in your counter and it dissolves really well in whatever elixir or beverage you're making. It doesn't leave this weird film on the top. Don't get me wrong, MCT oil still has its benefits, but MCT oil powder is that much better. I love it. And guess what? Perfect Keto is coming out with a matcha flavored one. Ours is on its way. We can't wait to try it and we can't wait for you guys to try yours. As a listener of our show, you get 20% off all your Perfect Keto products. Super easy to take advantage. Go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash perfect keto. Again, that's ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash perfect keto. These products ship worldwide, free shipping in the US. They rock. Go and get some right now. Here's a review from one of our amazing listeners. Digialdi from the USA. This is a five-star review titled A Ton of Great Information. This podcast has helped me advance on my wellness and health journey so much. Every episode is packed with great information, resources, and incredible guests. No matter where you are in your wellness path, even if you're a starter and just stumbled upon this gem, you are going to learn new things that you can immediately start incorporating into your life. But be careful, this podcast is addicting. Thank you so much, Digiality. What a wonderful review. We love reading them all. Thank you so much for those kind words. It means so much to us. And Marty and I read each and every review, even if we don't get a chance to share it on the show. We thank everybody for taking the time to do that. And if you haven't left us a rating and review yet, it's super easy to do. Just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash iTunes. Again, that's ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash iTunes. We thank you guys ahead of time. You rock. And now back to our interview with Naveen. And this is where Viome comes in, where we're actually looking at that system, our microbiome, and assessing actually what is happening on an individual basis. So let's talk about that a little bit, what you guys are actually doing there. So basically, the technology for Viome came from Los Alamos National Lab, where they had designed this technology for biodefense work for national security, where the problems were very similar. They were trying to find out if somebody is sick because of some biological uh, agent, how would we know what is really going on inside the body and what's making people sick? So we actually got the exclusive license to the technology that allows us to look at every single organisms in the gut and find out not only what these organisms are, but more importantly, how active they are and what they are actually doing. That means we are able to not only tell you that every single strain of every bacteria, every virus, whether it's a DNA virus, RNA virus, or even the bacteriophages, the yeast, fungus, and mold, we can also tell you that which one of these organisms are really, really active and really replicating themselves really fast. But the most important part that really helps us is 
what are they doing? Are they producing short chain fatty acids? Are they producing vitamin B? Are they producing vitamin K? What kind of enzymes they are producing? What kind of nutrients they are producing? And what kind of toxins they are producing? Because all of those things start to get absorbed in the blood. And that's what really the host starts to react. And when our microbial ecosystem is imbalanced, it causes our immune system to become hyperactive. And that means it starts to inflame. And every single chronic disease really comes from a chronic inflammation. So most people may not realize that whether the disease is called Parkinson's or Alzheimer or autism or called depression or anxiety, or it's called cancer or obesity or diabetes or autoimmune diseases, these are just the names for the symptoms that you see, but the underlying cause is exactly the same, which is a chronic inflammation. So what if we can modulate the chronic inflammation by simply modulating the microbiome? That means if we can feed the right diet to these microbiome and keep them in balance, then you will have the body that actually stays in balance and stays at ease. And our hope really is, and our moonshot for Wyom is to be able to create a world where illness can truly be a matter of choice, not a matter of bad luck. And imagine if we can create that world where no one ever had to be sick until they made a decision to be sick. Wouldn't that be the world that all of us want to live in? It'd be amazing. And I really want to get deeper into the microbiome in a sec, but I know you also talk about how a lot of these diseases, and we know this, are more in first world countries as opposed to in third world. And that's as a result of potentially all the pharmaceuticals and the drugs that we're reliant on. Can we just talk about this and how this is something that we're creating this self-inflated vicious cycle? Yes, it's a self-inflicted wound is what we have created here. So as we started to move from the agricultural society more into the urban areas, so when you live in the farm, you are constantly being exposed to the chickens and the cows and the whole microbial ecosystem and your immune system actually is trained to deal with all of that. When you start to move into the urban areas and you're constantly washing your hand with the Purell, the kids are not playing in the dirt and we're not even exposed to any of the trees or farm animals our immune system is just not very well trained. And what happens is come spring, we start to sneeze in the runny nose and the itchy eyes. And as if the world is ending, somebody should tell the immune system, it's a pollen, take a chill pill, you're not dying anytime soon, right? But it doesn't know any difference because it's never been exposed to anything like that. So I think what happens is that this idea of the more hygienic we are becoming, unless we are actually training our immune system, and our whole microbial ecosystem inside our gut is actually is not diverse anymore. And when the children are not playing in the dirt, they're not actually getting all those organisms in the gut. Second thing that's really happening is this idea of C-section delivery. I did not realize until I was reading recently that 33% of all the delivery that happens in our country here is through C-section, and that's primarily for convenience, not because it's needed. And when you have a baby born that comes through C-section, the baby does not get any of the microbial exposure that they would get by going through the birth canal. And, you know, there are a lot of things you can think about that. Why would nature have this idea of labor? It's not the nature's way of punishing the women for having a baby. When you have a labor, it's really moving the microbes actually from the gut to the birth canal. So as the baby is getting ready to come out, it's being exposed to all that and moving a lot of microorganisms into the breast. So when you start to feed the baby, the baby is actually being fed with all the microorganisms. Very interesting thing is the first couple of days of the breast milk, the colostrum, cannot be digested by the human body. It can only be digested by the microbes. So imagine the nature created an offspring and realized that the best way to keep this offspring healthy is to not feed the offspring, but feed the microbes. So nature knew that the best way to keep the healthy body is to have the healthy microbial ecosystem. And somehow we forget that when we take antibiotics because taking antibiotics like throwing a nuclear bomb inside the body, it kills everything. It kills the bad guys and it kills everything else around it. And then suddenly you have no microbial ecosystem inside your gut that's going to provide the nutrients that the body needs. The food that's being grown, all the pesticide, especially this glyphosate, The glyphosate is like a roundup. The whole purpose of that is to kill all the organisms in the crop. 
And when you spray that, imagine when you get the glyphosate inside the body, what it's doing is killing the whole ecosystem. So really these pesticides that we're using and the GMO foods, all of those are contributing to this massive problem of us developing these chronic diseases where we spend now 90% of our healthcare costs are in these chronic diseases that completely could be avoided by simply the proper diet. What are we supposed to do if we've been through all this? We haven't grown up on a farm. Maybe we were born via C-section. We've been exposed to GMO crops and different things that have got us to this point where our microbiome just isn't right. Where do we go to start to rebuild that in a proper way? Yeah, so the good thing is that all of these things are fortunately reversible in a sense that even though the body has gone through a lot of damage, it can be mostly reversed by simply now eating the right set of prebiotics. That means the things that can feed the microbes that are already there, taking some of the probiotics. So taking the prebiotics and the probiotics and adjusting your diet would start to build the ecosystem and having a diverse set of diets would also help. But the thing that what we're realizing is there is no such thing as universal healthy diet. So there is no one diet that's good for all of us. A diet that's good for you may not be good for me. And the worst part is the diet that's good for me today may not be good for me three months from now. That means you have to constantly adjust our diet as the body is changing and adapting. And I think it's very interesting is that I was going to give you my personal example of how I went through the same process of having a really screwed up gut ecosystem and balancing it now. So I was trying to lose 10 pounds and I had my blood glucose was at a pre-diabetic level. The general advice I got was cut down all the carbs and don't eat any starch. I'm a vegetarian to begin with. So I'm all I'm now eating was the spinach and avocado, the lentils and the legumes and tofu. And it turns out that in the beginning for the first month or so it worked. And then guess what? After a year, I gained all the weight back. And my blood glucose was exactly where it was. And in fact, climbing. After I started Viome, I was the first guinea pig who did the test. And it turns out that I needed to be actually eating more than half my diet needs to be carbs. And I need to avoid spinach, avocado, lentil, legumes, and tofu. So imagine every single thing that I was doing, what I thought was healthy for me, was actually turned out to be unhealthy for me. And I would argue that partially it is because I was on such a strict diet, I was only feeding the certain set of microbes and other set of microbes were actually not getting fed. So now I have to avoid all the stuff that I was eating, feed the other set of microbes and create the balance. And then I can go back and probably start eating other things at the same time. So I just want to clarify for the listeners. I just want to explain what Viome is. What does someone do? Like, is it a gut test? Is it a poop test? Let's just go through the process so people have an idea when we're talking about Viome, what's actually happening. It's very interesting. As you can probably realize that me being Indian, the word we is not something I can pronounce. Right? And everybody asks me, why would you start a company and name something that you can't even pronounce? And I said, don't ask me that. It's so (laughs) happy. I was looking at the dictionary and the Y comes from the word life and the omics is science. So idea was to create a science of life. And when I say why, when people say starts with W, and I say, no, it's V, V, V. And I say, what's V? And it's like, forget it, I give up. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about how this works. Basically, the way it works is that when you sign up, you get a kit at home and you don't have to go to a doctor. You don't have to get a prescription from a doctor. The kit comes, there are two boxes. One is called metabolic intelligence and the other one is called gut intelligence. A gut intelligence is Essentially, a stool test, it comes with a simple thing where you take it just a touch of a stool and put in the test tube and you send it to us. And the metabolic intelligence test is something you do at home. That means you finger prick it when you wake up in the morning, get the basic measure of your glucose, the fasting glucose, and then you essentially take a shake, you drink it, and then you measure again in 45 minutes later and the 15 minutes later. And the graph of that tells us that how does your body digest fat, protein, and carbohydrates. In the next couple of months, we'll be adding some very, very interesting set of things that I think will give us a very deep molecular level how our body is functioning. One of them is a called blood transcriptome test. It's a genetic intelligence test. What we do is take two drops of blood and you send that to us in a test tube. And then we completely do an RNA sequencing of that blood that allows us to look at all the mitochondrial gene expression 
And most of your audience might, you know, remember the mitochondria from their high school biology class. It's an organelle inside the human cell. It used to be an ancient bacteria, but it really is the energy factory for the human cell. A mitochondria provides all the energy that the cells need. It has its own set of genes, which are different from the human genes. So we are able to look at all the gene expression and the mitochondrial biogenesis, which is replication of these bacteria that how fast they're growing because they provide us energy. And then we look at all the blood gene expression. And then more importantly, we also are able to look at the microbiome of the blood. And you're probably thinking, I didn't realize that the blood has the microbiome and people think that it's in the microbiome only resides in your gut. It turns out that our blood has a very rich microbiome. So when you are able to do the blood transfusion based on the blood type, what most people don't realize is you're also getting the whole set of organisms from one person to another person. So something that could be commensal or basically fine for one person could cause a low-grade inflammation in someone else. So this is, you know, now, I don't know if you saw the recent set of articles that are coming out that shows that even the breast cancer is caused by the microbiome in the breast rather than actually a lot of the genes that people thought was causing it. How microbiome are directly responsible for diseases like Parkinson's disease or diseases like autism and Alzheimer's. In fact, there is a very strong research around depression, anxiety with microbiome You know, in fact, there is not a day that goes by every disease from age-related macular disease. This morning, it was around microbiome communicating with mitochondria and microbiome using the vagus nerve to communicate directly with the brain using a lot of the neurotransmitters. So basically, our gut and brain is directly connected. As a matter of fact, so much so that a lot of people used to think that our gut is our secondary brain. My personal feeling is that we're going to realize that our gut actually is a primary brain and it is really our microbiome are the puppet masters and the thing that's sitting on the top of our shoulder really is puppet. It simply follows the directions of the thing that are happening in your gut. And as most of us intuitively will know, when we are anxious, we see the butterfly in the stomach. We don't get the butterflies in the brain first. When you're depressed, you eat. And to large extent, when you crave for something, it's not your brain craving, it's actually your gut microbes that are craving. When you feel full, it is the microbes signaling that they are full. And when you feel hungry, it's your microbes communicating and say, feed me. So to large extent, I think we're going to realize just like the olden days, we used to believe the earth is the center of our solar system until smarter guys figured out that, you know, it's the sun. And I think that same thing is going to happen to our human body. The sooner or later, we're going to realize that our gut is really the control center and everything else in the body is simply the puppet that these puppet masters drive. And no reason these guys are genetic expression perspective, 99% of our genes. Naveen, when you shared your story there and talked about how food actually plays a role in changing the microbiome, depending on once we get testing done, seeing where we're at and seeing what we need to do to get it back to a level of optimization. But what role do oral probiotic capsules have in restoring the gut microflora? So the interesting thing is, I would say 90% of the probiotics currently being sold are completely useless. All the biotics that are sent through these capsules most of them end up dying in the stomach through the stomach acid. And very few of them actually get hold in the gut. And the reason is many of these strains that you send, actually, even if they end up being in the large colon where where all the microbiota is in the uh, large intestine, what happens is that existing ecosystem will not let them take hold and they essentially get killed. And that's another technology that we are licensing from Los Alamos where what they have actually figured out is that if you want to reduce a set of microbes and you want to increase the population of another set of microbes, what cocktail of these organisms have to come together that are symbiotic together, that means they feed on each other and the prebiotic that has to go with them. So when they send them together, they can form the relationship with some of the microbacteria that are already in your gut and become antagonistic to others so they can actually now get hold. That means no single strain of bacteria would work. And what people are doing is selling the same set of probiotics to everyone. And what's the point until this thing is personalized, just like your food, 
it is a complete waste because I may already have too much of those bacteria or worse yet, I have too little of them and the other things, as soon as these things come in, they're going to kill it because there's just not enough of them in the gut to begin with to be able to take a strong hold of them. So it really have to be personalized and someday we're going to have just like the personalized food, we're going to have these personalized set of probiotics that will be designed for each person and change as the gut is evolving, just like we have to change the food. And the recommendations that we make today are very, very specific. Like for me, it will say, avoid spinach, but eat kale or don't eat carrot, but eat the cauliflower. So it's really specific about what food one can eat. And you have to constantly re-monitor yourself once you change your diet because it's not something that's going to stay the same for the rest of your life. It's like a car. If you don't keep it tuned, it's going to start falling apart again. Now we're going to take another quick break from our chat with Naveen to give a shout out to our show sponsor, Sun Warrior. I hope you guys have had a chance to see Sun Warrior's brand new packaging It is a tub made from recycled material. It's BPA-free, and it's got a flip-top lid. And if you have old tubs kicking around, you can absolutely reuse these at home. You can store kids' toys in them. You can store dry food in them. You can make a bird feeder out of them. Get crafty. Have fun with it. And we would love to see what you guys do with your old tubs. Tag a picture on Instagram and make sure you tag at Ultimate Health Podcast and Sun Warrior and use the hashtag Retub. That way we can see what crafty ways you're using old Sun Warrior tubs. As a listener of our show, you get an incredible deal on all Sun Warrior products, 10% off. To take advantage, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. Again, that's ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. If you bundle your order together, spend $100 or more, you get free shipping. These products rock. Marnie and I love them. Go and take advantage right now. So throughout the interview, you guys are learning about Viome. Viome is a company focused on disrupting healthcare with the goal of making illness elective. They develop technologies to analyze the biochemistry and ecosystem of the body that consists of millions of metabolites and trillions of microorganisms. Their plan is to identify biomarkers that are predictive of chronic diseases and prevent them through personalized diet and nutrition. So as a listener of our show, Naveen's decided to give you an incredible deal, 10% off if you want to get testing done through Viome. Marty and I have our kits on the way right now. So if you're interested in taking advantage of this deal, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Viome. That's V-I-O-M-E. Again, that's ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Viome. Go and take advantage right now. And now back to our interview with Naveen. So I know for foods, it's very specific to the person. Does that go for nutrients as well? Or are there some nutrients that you would say are necessary and vital for the microbiome? Actually, interesting thing is no such thing as a good thing. So whether you say it's calcium or whether you take the vitamin B or vitamin K, anything that's good can also become bad in the large quantity. So if you start to take a lot of vitamin D, you're going to start to have the same set of issues as you have when you have too little vitamin D. So there is no such thing. So what we do is we start to look at what enzymes are missing, what cofactors are missing. Do you really need to be taking magnesium and zinc and not take CoQ10? Or you really need CoQ10, but you are pissing off everything else, right? That means we are able to tell you very, very specifically what set of enzymes and minerals that you really need in your body and rest of them on you're wasting. So for example, by looking at your microbiome, we can say that drinking a pomegranate juice for you is a complete waste of money because it's not going to do anything good, whereas for someone else, it could actually be doing good depending on your gut microbiota. Or worse yet, when you do drink something that your microbiota can digest, in that case, you're putting a stress on the body. And now somebody has to detoxify what you're drinking or eating. So we could look at today by your gut and by simply looking at your microbiota, we can predict what you have been eating. We can predict what type of enzymes and the minerals when you take what is going to happen to it. And that's by monitoring all these pathways in your gut and looking at the things and saying what is being absorbed in the blood through these called metabolites and how is your host going to act on it. So that means not looking at the genes because a lot of the people really, you know, who have been enamored by these 23andMe type of genetic testing is to large extent done a disservice to the humanity because, you know, your genes, your DNA 
we all of us have more or less the same DNA. That means any two people have really shared 99.5% same DNA. Me and the tree share 90% same DNA. That means you plant and humans are really not that much different, right? The thing that really, really interesting is that if you look at just ourselves as individual, our hair and our lungs and our skin and our tooth, they all have exactly the same DNA. And thankfully, we don't have the tooth growing up on our head because that really won't look very good, right? Is really the gene expression is what makes everything work. It's not the actual DNA. It's not the actual genes. It's actually what's being expressed is what really matters. And that's the reason we don't look at the DNA because DNA is like an alphabet. It simply tells you what all things that are possible. You could use the same alphabet and write a beautiful poetry or you can write a shitty rap song, right? It's really the same alphabet. And same thing with the genes that you can start to look at your genes. If it's not being expressed, it's not there. And your microbes through this epigenetic mechanism really control what genes are going to be expressed, underexpressed, or overexpressed. So we focus on mostly around gene expression of what is going on, what's going on, not what could have been going on. And that is really the key to good health. Nibi, I'm going to switch gears here and talk about entrepreneurship. And I'd love just for you to kick off talking about what qualities do you think make up a successful entrepreneur? To me, it's really about being intellectually curious. And the reason for that is because if you are intellectually curious, you are able to question every single thing that people who are expert have taken it for granted. And that's one reason I always say that the most disruptive ideas come not from experts, but actually come from non-experts. So if you look at me as an example, I went and started the disruptive company for space exploration. I'm not a rocket scientist. I am doing things that fundamentally will disrupt the whole healthcare industry. And my hope is that by the time I'm done, the whole healthcare system as we know of it today will completely implode. That means there will be no insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies and the hospitals because the consumer is going to be empowered with information and actionable results. Because when we are sick, we don't want to feel helpless and hopeless. Because when you feel helpless and hopeless, you will going to be victimized by someone else, and which is exactly what's happening today. So that's the reason we started direct to consumer. But coming back to the other quality of an entrepreneur really is looking at the world as you want the world to be, not what the world is. That means don't focus on looking at the glass being half empty or half full. Look at and saying, do I want to fill this glass or I don't want to fill this glass? So focus on what is it that you want the world to be. And the third quality really is about dreaming audacious goals, having audacious goal and having big dreams because it's easier to create a company that has a goal of changing the way people are going to live their lives than to do something small. If you were to build another iPhone app, you're not going to be able to attract the best talent. When you say, I'm going to make illness optional, you're able to attract the talent, some of the best and the brightest talent from around the world. And that's exactly what we did. And the last quality I would say would be really never giving up because as an entrepreneur, you only fail when you give up. Everything else is just a pivot. And every idea that does not work is simply a stepping stone to a different idea and a bigger idea. So just keep pivoting and moving forward. And when you give up is the day when you fail. And you're a fan of setting huge goals. You actually say that you should be at the point with your goals where people think you're crazy. And if not, you're not thinking big. So how do we go about setting these big goals? Where does somebody start? Most entrepreneurs, the reason they fail are because they set out to make money. And that to me is really where the things start to go wrong. The easiest way to create a billion dollar company is to solve a $10 billion problem. And these $10 billion problem happens to be many of these large societal problems. That means the greatest challenge is facing humanity. And if you can solve a problem that impacts a billion people, you can create a $10 billion company. That means whether you create abundance of fresh water, create abundance of energy, create abundance of food. What if we can create so much of energy that it becomes like air? It becomes free, like oxygen. It's there in the atmosphere. It's democratic and it's free. 
What if the food was so much in abundance, it's the next year? What if the water was so much in abundance, it becomes in the next year, it's democratized and demonetized? The problems are many, and all that means is the opportunities are many. All that it takes is a small group of people to say, I'm going to dedicate my life to solving this problem. So when you start a company, ask yourself, God forbid, if I'm going to be actually successful in doing what I'm trying to do, would it change the life of a billion people? Ask yourself, what am I willing to die for and then live for it? And that's how you move the society forward. Well, Naveen, fear of failure is such a common thing for people. And I'm sure if people start setting these huge goals, that's going to come into play even more than just setting, quote unquote, average type goals. How does somebody overcome that? When you have large goals, which are audacious goals, remember, that is a vision that you want. And then you take a smaller slices of them and you start executing on a slice by slice. So you create the milestones and says, you know what, I'm going to make chronic illness optional. The first thing I'm going to do is to start understanding what these microbes are doing. And I'm going to start working on making people feel better. And while we are doing that, we are getting more and more feedback data. So your artificial intelligence is getting smarter and smarter. And the more things we're doing, that is getting better every single day. And that becomes the virtuous cycle that more we learn, the better we get. And as we starting to get more and more people on the system, Every single person who joins Wyom today not only benefits themselves, they benefit the humanity because it makes the system better. That means the people who came before them and people who come after them, everyone benefits. And it becomes really a project that is owned by the society saying, what if we all together can create a world where illness is optional? So I didn't say we are going to create a world where there is no sickness. Because that shows that I have that power and I can make that impact. The reason I say that we can make chronic illness a matter of choice, it says it really is up to an individual and all of us have to come together to make that dream come true. I don't have a fairy dust that can say, I'm going to sprinkle that fairy dust in this world and make the illness disappear. So I feel like there's two kinds of people. There's people who have lots of ideas and may or may not get started on them. And then there's also the people who are just kind of bored with life and know that they need something new and maybe have the inability to generate new ideas. So where can people start to start getting creative and start to imagine? I know you like that word. So there are three types of people in this world. The people who come up with a set of problems. And since all of us are really, really good at them, let's call them human beings. The second set of people are the people who come up with a solution to these problems. And these are the scientists and the visionaries. And the people who actually go out and start executing on those solutions are the ones that are called entrepreneurs. So entrepreneurs are the problem solvers and the doers. The best way I find really is to find what is the problem that you care enough that you're willing to die for. And then you start to find what technologies are available to you that can be applied to it. So I can tell you the way I do that. Every single day, I get up around 4, 4.30 in the morning. And I spend two to three hours every single day reading all of the scientific journals. I mean, I'm reading them in the nanotechnology, the neuroscience, the genetics and the epigenetics and the microbiomics and artificial intelligence. And the reason for that is because every time I read something, it allows me to pick a dot and I keep collecting dots until I find that missing dot that says, aha, now I can go and solve this problem that has been bugging me for a long time. That means The more you read, the more you learn, and the constant intellectual curiosity allows you to start thinking about how to apply the technology to solve the problem. And I believe there is no problem that's big enough that innovation and entrepreneurship can't solve. And I think a lot of the times people get focused on using the technology that exists today rather than looking at where the technology is headed and really start to build the company based on where the technology is going to be, not where the technology is. And it's like if you are a hockey player, go where the puck is going to be, not where the puck is. And if you're a soccer player, you probably know that when you're a third grader, you follow the ball. And when you're a professional player, you actually go where the ball is going to come to you. So you give us a little taste of how your mornings start. And I want to go a little bit further. But first, I'd love to know what were some of the findings that you read about today? What's new in the world today? 
actually, uh, there are a couple of very interesting things. If you go to my Facebook page, you will see them. The very interesting article that came out around, I think it was multiple cirrhosis and it was around cystic fibrosis that they actually found the actual microbe that causes the cystic fibrosis. And that was this morning. There was another research that I saw that talks about specific pathways when that's activated causes the gluten sensitivity. And, you know, every time we read something, I ask my scientists, I say, can we detect it? You know, what would it take to get this thing done? So point is to be constantly at the cutting edge, constantly challenging ourselves and constantly focus on the one simple goal, which says, what can we do to move the society forward? What can we do to continue to focus on a North Star to make the chronic illness optional? And every single day when you wake up and you say, I am lucky to be working on the things that I enjoy. Because the people who set out to make money, they rarely end up money. And I think you probably heard me say that making money is like having an orgasm. If you focus on it, you'll never get it. (laughs) But we have to be very discerning too with everything that we're reading and everything that's coming out because there's so much information. So how do we take either some of it with a grain of salt, but some of it, how do we actually know what's true and what's not? you start to discount the opinions of others. So you don't look at the opinions, you simply look at the peer-reviewed scientific journals. So I am not looking at some Paul saying, I believe the coconut oil is good for you or bad for you. I don't read that stuff. I simply focus on peer-reviewed scientific journals and exactly what studies are being done. Are these a double-blind study? Is it N of one or is it N of thousand? So really focusing down on what exactly the study is. Don't focus on the headline, but really look at what a study actually shows because 90% of the time, the headline actually is misleading. So you really have to spend time understanding the underlying research. If it is funded by something whose outcome is going to benefit them, I discount that. So Naveen, let's come back to your morning routine. You wake up at 4.30, you do your reading. What do you do after that? You know what I'm going to say that. Don't ever follow the habits of anyone else. Follow their thought process because habits don't get you to become like another person. Tony Robbins takes an ice bath every day. You can take an ice bath three times a day. It's not going to make you Tony Robbins, right? What's going to make you Tony Robbins is to think like Tony Robbins. So I can tell you my thought process. So if you really want someone to start saying, how can they start executing their on their own moonshots, then they have to start thinking like me, not behaving like me. I can tell you, you can get up at three o'clock in the morning. It's not going to make you achieve your moonshots. What's going to help you achieve your moonshot is to really thinking about possibilities. You start thinking about, do you really care enough that you know, you're willing to give last drop of blood to make that happen? Do you really care enough to solve this problem? Is this something you're calling or is this something you're doing it for simply to live a good life? Other way of looking at this stuff is to say, if you had everything in the world that you want, you have a billion dollars, you have a wonderful family, you have everything, what would you do? And if you do that today, you will get everything that you want. So focus on what you really care about, what you want to dedicate your life to. And a lot of the people that I don't understand is, you know, they spend their weekends playing golf, chasing a small ball. And I really wonder, If you have that much time in your life to be chasing a small ball, I think you should give someone a permission to shoot you so that you don't become a parasite on humanity. Well, Naveen, I think an important part of this too is that we don't want to wait and become an expert before we take action. So you're a perfect example of this. You've started Viome, you have Moon Express, and you've become an expert in these different fields across the board. So I think a lot of times people are waiting and waiting to gather information and learn and get to a certain point. But you talk about how if we're in that naive place as a beginner, we actually have what it takes to disrupt the industry. So I think that's just an important point for people to think about and just get out there and do it. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's really the key is don't get discouraged and say, what do I know about this? And the fact you don't know about this, it really makes you the best person to solve it. And if you're kind enough, what I could do is send you a ebook that I wrote around moonshots and that really talks about how to think about these problems. And if you could just put that ebook, it's free to download and you can just get your audience to actually read that. I think that will help. Yeah, no, we'll link that up in the show notes over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com so listeners can just 
go and check that out after the show. Yeah. And I think also, if you don't mind putting a link to the Wyom so that people can essentially who are interested in learning more about it can go there because I can never pronounce the Wyom anyway. So you have to put a link to that. (laughs) Of course, we're going to link everything up. Naveen, how else can listeners connect with you after the show? I am actually the easiest person to find. You can find me on a social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook, or you can email it to me. My email is my first name, Naveen dot last name Jan, J-A-I-N, at gmail.com. And I read all my emails. So I can tell you that if you're going to be asking me to invest in your company, the answer is no. So don't send your email. But if you have any other questions about being an entrepreneur, I'm available to you. What is one piece of inspiration you can leave the listeners with? A takeaway at the end of this interview, something they can implement in the next week. I would say is that do what your heart desires. Don't let someone tell you that you can't do it or it's not possible. Get rid of every single person who laughs at your ambition or someone who tells you that you can't do it. Just get rid of them because you become the average of the 10 people that you surround yourself with. So if you have anyone in your 10 people that you're closest to who is negative, just get rid of them and you will have a better life. Thank you so much. We love that. So Naveen, this was amazing. So much great information. We're going to link everything up. And thanks again for coming on the show. Well, thank you very much. It's been just absolutely wonderful. If your brain is exploding with information, that is a good thing. Naveen is truly one of a kind. So much great information today. And make sure you guys are following us over on Instagram. We're always posting the new shows as they're released. And we're also posting what's going on in our life in between episodes. So through our Instagram pictures and our stories, you guys will see Jesse and I, what we look like and what we're up to and what Goji looks like. So make sure you're following along at Ultimate Health Podcast. I want to give some love to our engineer and editor, Jason Sanderson at podcasttech.com. He does such a great job putting the show together. Thank you so much, Jace. And a fun fact this week about Jace, he has a hard time deciding if he prefers Oslo or Barcelona as his favorite city in the world. If any of you guys have a love of either of these cities, share with us over on Instagram. Have a great week, you guys. We'll talk soon. Take care.